Welcome everyone to the 2019 Scientific Rigor and Reproducibility Workshop at University of Pennsylvania for the graduate program in, anyone want to fill us in? Genomics and Computational Biology. Got it, Genomics and Computational Biology. So we've got an hour session today uh, to go over the tools that one needs today to be um, doing computational research with great rigor and reproducibility. These, this Google Doc is online, uh, and it's going to be largely example-driven. Please interrupt as much as you want. We want a lot of discussion, um, interaction. If you disagree with me, let that be known. And um, yeah, volunteer if you want to say anything else that, that I've overlooked. Uh, in these top links, there's some materials for the, uh, previous years or uh, previous presentations related to this, but I'm just going to kind of jump into the workflow. Hey, Ben. Hello. <laughs> um, the workflow that, that I envision. So uh, let's start with the traditionals, which is that of publication. Uh, as everyone here is aware, journal publication is a big part of um, academia and scientific communication and how knowledge is shared. And traditionally, that's been kind of the main ways that scientists share knowledge. There are some exciting changes coming in publication <laughs> that have, uh, are relevant here, so, so I'd like to discuss some of those. Uh, I think the first major one is preprints. Does anyone want to jump in and say what a preprint is? Exactly, yeah. So it's a um, version of a manuscript that you just post without having to go through the journal process and get peer review. And it's not mutually exclusive with getting that peer review, but it does allow you to get your study out there potentially a year or two um, before, you know, say a journal would go through the process and finally publish it. Now, in the current environment, generally preprints are not like a substitute for going through. Um, a journal and a lot of like uh, people who evaluate your work would want to see that it's gone through peer review. Um, although people like Ben and Casey are doing stuff to change that with their bio overlay service where people just review preprints uh, and post those comments online. And we may see maybe in 10 or 20 years an environment where uh, you can just post your work as a preprint and people give feedback to it and scientists come to consensus on the quality of it. Um, but for now, in your graduate career, you'll probably work with both preprints and publications. And a lot of, say, professors who've been around for a little while may be less familiar with preprints. So at least in my case, I had to go to my PI when I was a graduate student and say, hey, can we post a preprint for <laughs> this uh, study and he said, well, I don't know what that is. Are you sure the journals are okay with it? Usually they don't like it. I said, well, yeah, they have policies that allow it now. Um, and then he was okay with it. So oftentimes you may have to initiate that conversation, but it's worth having, I think. Um, some of the preprint servers that are most relevant to our field are BioArchive. BioArchive has maybe the highest um, volume of biological preprints. So we can click on one here. And you can see it's uh, these people have posted a PDF. Hopefully with a method section. Yeah, so there's um, <laughs> some people are posting preprints without methods because maybe they get some attention or credit um, without doing all the work. But I guess you're not a fan. Let's see here results. 
discussion methods. There you go. <laughs> Uh, another one is PeerJ preprints. And I tend to like PeerJ preprints because I think the interface is a little bit nicer. Um, but it doesn't quite have the same, let's say, community traffic. Uh, another one which is mostly used in like the mathematical and computational and physical sciences is Archive. Now this has been around like 30 years and is um, what led to the name BioArchive. Uh, so preprints are nothing new, but they're a little bit newer for biology. Any questions on? How much overlap is there? Do people generally post on all three? Or Most of them have policies that you're not supposed to cross post. Um, yeah, and the idea is it, it's kind of difficult to make a policy because obviously there's going to be some repetition when you have a preprint and then a journal publication mm -hmm. of the same content being multiple places. But I think the preprint servers often think that you probably shouldn't have a preprint at so many locations. Are there any Especially, major, yeah. Are there any major biomedical journals that still don't allow you to post preprints? Is that New England Journal of Medicine? Have they changed it? Has a policy that doesn't allow? I yeah. I think yeah, they might still be allowed. They did as a couple years ago. Oh yeah, they were definitely yeah. So you should check that. Um, there are very few journals that do not allow it. Uh, this Wikipedia page is a good one, uh, and then there's something called Sherpa Romeo, which also has um, this information and a newer database called Transpose which may also have this information, but for most journals, uh, they will allow the preprints, and I would say it's quite regressive when they don't. Okay, on to persistent identifiers. Um, who here knows what a DOI is? Seems like some people don't know, so I'm really glad I, I came to preach a DOI. It is a digital object identifier, and it's an ID which is being given to a lot of different scientific outputs and uh, most journal publications at this time. So for example, if you see here, this preprint has a DOI. And what's really useful about this DOI is you can always link to this preprint via that DOI. Um, it also, uh, say, provides a way to uniquely identify this study. This identifier, which always starts with 10, if you have it, you can always get back to the study. Uh, so maybe, say, this link would change, but in the future you can still get here. And it's also useful for purposes of citation. because there are databases with the metadata. <laughs> um, well, we have a situation here where the metadata hasn't yet been deposited to Crossref. BioArchive has a problem where their metadata doesn't immediately go to Crossref. Uh, but with, say, in a week, this, w this metadata would be here. Um, let's see if PureJ is doing any better. You'll notice V2 at the end of this DOI. Uh, so PeerJ does a nice job of having a version preprint. Uh, and so here you go. This database now has the title, the authors, uh, like the data was published. So ideally, your citation manager can just take the DOI and then take all the data in such that you don't have to be typing in the authors and a, you know, all, there's a high risk for error if you have to type in stuff manually. Um, other sort of persistent IDs and databases you should be aware of are PubMed. Um, anyone want to tell me what they know about PubMed? I, I may randomly call on people. <laughs> let's, uh, let's start with you. Yeah, and you can pass if you don't know anything. Okay, 
Not bad. Do you have anything to add to that? Cool. I, I'd agree. Let's uh, go down the line. <laughs> Anything extra to that? Yeah. Not really. I mean, the way that search for literature. Okay. Cool. So, so, yeah, those are all right. This is a resource um, created by the National Library of Medicine and the NCBI. So, it's a government resource. It sometimes doesn't work during shutdowns. <laughs> <laughs> um, but <laughs> the it's nice because it uh, like Crossref, it has content from many different journals going back very far in time. Uh, but it only has abstracts; it doesn't have full text of the articles. Um, but all the articles do have IDs. So maybe if we search Voit, I hope I. <laughs> well, I don't even know if this is you, but. Um, <laughs> that's, that's me. Ah, in bone. <laughs> so he, he, here's the ID. Uh, and this sort of like a DOI, if you have this ID, you can always, you know, get back to that study and you can get metadata from this database. Now, there's something else called PubMed Central. Does anyone want to take a gander at how PubMed Central is different than PubMed? Um, let's continue incrementing here. Uh, looks like it's full text, not just abstracts. That's right, yeah. Uh, so with PubMed Central, there is full text of the articles, and like the publishers often submit it in this XML format such that it, they can all be shown in the same format and it's really great for text mining. Um, a lot of text mining in science uses this because all the articles are in the standardized XML format. Um, I believe studies which have uh, NIH funding are supposed to go into PubMed not more than a year past when they're published. Uh, and so I think as a researcher if you publish in a way where your work goes into PubMed that's helpful for you because then it's more likely to be discovered by um, sort of programs or bots or mind. Um, I should note that not all journals go into PubMed or PubMed Central. Um, it's mostly like biomedical journals. So that's something you can check. Uh, two other things we'll mention, like another type of uh, standard identifier or persistent identifier is an ISBN and that's usually given to books. And then a new cool resource is Wikidata, which is essentially Wikipedia, but um, for any sort of factual data. Uh, so what Wikidata has is now a collection of a lot of scholarly works and they've signed IDs to them. And so sometimes this is helpful for things that don't have DOIs or PubMed IDs. And one shout out to a project I'm involved in related to publishing is Manubot. Um, and what Manubot is, is a way to write your papers on GitHub uh, in a way where the content of your paper is open and tracked over time. And it gets, so, so this is the content of this paper we're writing called Meta Review. You can see it has these, this is the source content. And then it gets automatically compiled into this um, rendered HTML page. Uh, and the nice thing here is whenever you update the source, it updates the output, and it automates a lot of things like citations. Uh, so if you're a really computational person that likes Git, uh, check this out. And if not, hopefully by the end of your PhD, you can write your thesis in it <laughs> once you've learned Git better. Um, so two other things we have to mention before moving on from publications. Uh, the first one is open access. Uh, so this is the idea that articles should be free to read and preferably openly licensed. So not only free to read, but um, shared in such a way that they can be freely reused. Like 
uh, usually people use a Creative Commons attribution license, meaning you can make changes or uh, share it as long as you cite the original. Um, and that kind of fits very nicely with academic norms because we usually want people to share and build off our work. Um, but say without this, without a, an open license, someone wouldn't be able to say translate your paper into a different language um, or say potentially even use your figure in a presentation. Copyright law is really complicated and varies where you are in the world, but um, if you put on an open license, that sort of allows the whole world to use it in a more consistent and straightforward way. Um, regarding open access, I guess, um, let's go down the line. Can you tell me what open access is? Yeah, um, I would say that's one of the motivations. Uh, let's continue. Amy, do you? Uh, I guess specifically everyone can get it. Um, I guess it's like the yeah, it's, yeah, you can use it for your own purposes. You can't necessarily share it again, though. Is that? I, it would, I guess, yeah, there, there's different definitions. And um, sometimes it's it refers to just things that are free to read. And sometimes it's things that have no permission barriers. Um, but, but the main idea is that traditionally journals have been like toll access. Um, journals existed before the internet. And they had to get a, a business model on the internet. And they did something very similar to their print journals, where they just switched to charging uh, to view like the web page. And I'm sure all of you have hit the, a paywall you know, which potentially charges an outrageous rate to see the article. Um, now, the open access movement is the idea that why don't we just have these papers be free to read? Uh, because almost every stakeholder does want them to be free to read. Like the funders want them to be free. The researchers usually want them to be free because the journals aren't paying you any royalties. Um, essentially, authors just give their work to journals and then the journals sell that work and deprive people of access. So um, the solution is open access. And there's a growing number of open access journals. About like 10 to 15% of articles are now published in, in open access journals. And about 50% are open access in some form, like maybe put up on a repository, like they have a preprint. Um, they're in PubMed Central, that kind of thing. Um, so I would say for your own publications, I guess you should learn about this issue and think whether you want to publish in open access journals only or not. I personally have a policy where I don't publish in any journal that requires me to transfer copyright, um, which is essentially what allows them to sell the work and not let me to share the work. Um, unfortunately, a lot of like the most prestigious journals still have this leftover model of being toll access. So a journal like Nature will not allow or will require you to transfer copyright. Uh, and sometimes that's something that your PI does. But you should know that when I, if you've contributed to that manuscript, like written text or made um, like a figure, which you almost certainly have, <laughs> this is your PhD project, uh, you have a say because that is your creative work. Um, that either you or the university uh, owns. And I'm not sure who in this case. Um. So yeah, now let's get on. Uh, are any questions before we move on? OK, let's get to the, uh, the research process. So essentially, stuff that happens before publication. Um, and how to do science in a rigorous way. Let's continue around the circle. This is a harder one. Do you have any idea what I mean by real-time open notebook science? No, <laughs> OK. Um, well, I guess we'll have to continue around to Ben. Do you no, have any idea? <laughs> no one's exempt. No one's um, exempt. 
I mean, you, you're, you're, you're referring to sort of like what you could imagine in really the future where basically the science you do is in a public domain and accessible at all times by anyone at any time. So everything that you do is Great. That's is that great definition. That, that's what I meant. Uh, so this is the extreme. Yeah. <laughs> I, I usually follow this extreme. It's not going to be for everyone, but I think showing you the extreme kind of helps you understand the gradient and where you you may want to go with your research and how open it is and especially how immediately open it is. Uh, so the way that I've been doing my latest research projects is in a way that from their initiation, they're done essentially publicly, uh, which allows, say, anyone on the internet to come and give feedback, make suggestions, potentially even participate. Um, so for example, this was a study I did during my PhD on this site called Think Lab. It was a great site, but it, it um, was a startup that no longer is around. <laughs> So you can't actually use it for your research, but um, essentially we would have discussions. Um, so like I would make a post and different uh, community members would come and comment. And this worked really well because we could get a lot of different feedback on kind of complex issues and it brought a lot of people to our project. Um, Well, I, w I would say they are, um, we link to these discussions a lot, and so all their contributions remain publicly visible. Um, we acknowledge them in the paper that ended up coming from this project. Nowadays, I may consider whether some of these people qualified for authorship on a resulting publication. Um, yeah, so, what do you mean by credited, or, or what kind of credit are you thinking? Yeah. Um, so I think that's kind of an open question of, um, you know, who, who should be an author, and probably you should define a level of contribution. Um, there's like the ICMJE guidelines for authorship. That's what our lab tends to follow. And it lays out several things that co-authors should um, you know, have, have done or be willing to do. So one is like a substantial contribution. Uh, another one is that they've re read the work, I believe, um, and that they're willing to at least um, take responsibility for their part of the study, uh, that they want to be a co-author, <laughs> those sort of things. Um, so yeah, I would say that's maybe where to look. But um, another thing is if you're doing this on GitHub, which we now do, we just use like GitHub issues for the communication. Um, you'll have like contributors. Uh, so these are people who, who created you know code. So usually if someone's created a lot of code, they probably should be an author. Not maybe not in every case. Um, although there, there were people who were authors who didn't contribute code and contributed like discussion and stuff. Um, but having everything in the public makes it a lot more transparent and I, I think could help you. Like I know some people who have had projects and then some, you know, the situation turns south with the PI and then they leave and then their work gets put into some other paper and they don't get adequate credit if you're doing real-time open science and sort of all your contributions are online from when you made them, it's much harder for your contributions to be downplayed or ignored. Um, not that probably people have the intention of like stealing your contributions, but things can be messy in academia. And I think it helps keep everyone honest and remember what your contribution was if everything is in the public. I mean, it's easy to forget what people did. Uh, so that's another benefit of this model. And yeah, and actually, in both these studies, uh, we got a lot of people just coming in from the internet uh, who were very helpful that we wouldn't have had. Um, so I would recommend at this stage, probably everyone should release their like code and their notebooks when they preprint or publish a study. 
and you should strongly consider whether you want to do that from the beginning of the study. Um, and another thing about kind of the real-time open science is a lot of people now find things through Google and um, you know building up page rank takes time the sooner you get your work out there and the more work you get out there the more stuff you put on the internet you're going to get more traffic people are going to know you better uh, I think that's probably one of the most important ways to establish yourself these days is to kind of really put yourself out there um, um, what are the common Yes. Online and what are your answers to them? So, for example, I've heard graduate students argue to me that they shouldn't put their code available because they're scared that their code will be seen by future job prospective recruiters, and that might hurt the prospects mm. of getting a job because they think they'll be judged on the code that is <laughs> so, yeah. in the public domain. What you know? Are there other other reasons or other um, um, concerns people have? Like no, and, and definitely, especially when you start out, you know, you do feel a little bit vulnerable because, you know, you may not be the most experienced coder. Um, but what I would say is the process of sharing your code online, documenting it so other people can read it, engaging with other scientists who share the, the code, will by the time you complete your PhD, almost certainly result in you having better code than if you didn't. Um, and probably you will go to an employer and they will either test you for your um, your coding ability or ask you to submit code samples. And at least when I'm hiring people, if I can just see their GitHub and, and see that they have a lot of code and then I look at it and I think it's good, that's almost like a, a required step for me to even look at your um, application. So yes, it could backfire if you really had terrible code, but I, I think <laughs> it, you will get good code by the end. People understand that people grow. I mean, like if I look back at my first GitHub issues, I'm very embarrassed. <laughs> like, I, think I told the creator of like the, the um, Julia programming language that some issue was a bone breaking issue. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so you do make, you know, novice mistakes, but um, people will look at the more recent stuff and hey, someone may find that bad code useful if they're doing the same thing. Uh, the other reason people don't do it is it takes more time, but that's kind of a fallacy because in order for it to be sort of something that you could look back on in five years and you know, know what you were doing, you actually have to document it because you're gonna forget almost everything about it and therefore it's not, that much harder to document it for other people than it is yourself. Um, I call it, I, I use the argument that it's a gift to your future self, like yeah. three months in the future. I can barely remember the code that I wrote two weeks ago, let alone that I wrote five years ago. So having it well documented and organized, a little bit of extra effort is just such a time saver. You know, going from weeks to days to redo analysis or hours from days to do an analysis just cannot put a price on that because as much as valuable as the time you think you have now, I guarantee you your time is 10 to 100 times more valuable in the future just because you'll know more stuff, you'll have more stuff to do, your PI will be even more desperate to get your results out of you. You know what I'm talking about. So um, yeah, it's just, it's just true. Well said. I guess another reason people say don't share stuff, preliminary stuff, and this applies to preprints and findings before they've had a journal publication, is that they don't want to be, what is it called, scooped? Uh, and this is the idea someone would take, you know, your methods or, or your whatever you're doing and essentially publish it first. They wouldn't have had this idea without you. And for almost all projects, this is not the case. Like, it takes a lot of time for people to understand your code, and they're probably not going to go through it just to steal it. And if they do, you have this very clear record, wait, I did this. And if you see that they've stolen it, you can just be like, wait, you just stole this. Um, in fact, oftentimes I think it has an opposite effect where people could say, oh, he's or she is doing this project. I'm either going to A, try to collaborate with them, or like C, if... If we don't have to have repeated efforts, maybe 
collaborate in such a way where I take whatever part um, is useful. And second, maybe I just shouldn't do that because there's already someone who's further ahead than me. Um, this may not be true for all ideas. Like if you have some like super big discovery that's really very easy to prove once you know it, um, yes, I would be secretive until at least preprint stage. But um, I don't know, Ben, have, have you heard of people like re-engineering preprints? <laughs> Um, I mean, those things can happen, but usually it happens at the reviewer stage of anything, right, where um, you get a lot of good feedback from an initial submission, and then you update your preprint based on those reviewer comments before you go to a second journal submission. But like, um, yeah, I mean, sides can happen, it can take weird directions, but I mean, most, I mean, like the, what's the variance, I guess, is sort of what you're saying. I don't think the variance is so massive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I think preprints are really helpful for being scoop because it it used to be like someone would have a journal publication or like someone would be waiting to have their thing accepted or you know the journals are really slow it could take like a year and then someone publishes a similar work and then the journal's like no we don't want it anymore because it's not you know it doesn't have precedence and I think rightly so kind of the community is realizing it may not matter who publishes a month first. Um, but a preprint kind of helps you in that way. Um, it's insurance. So um, we're talking about documenting your work uh, and having it in such a way that it's easily understandable. I think a great thing for this are notebooks um, or similar tools. So <laughs> for example, this is a Jupyter Python notebook. Essentially what these notebooks are, are a way to have code intermixed with output and documentation. Uh, so for example, here is like a documentation cell and I've just put a title in it. Uh, then here comes some imports. So this is, these are all code cells. Um, and then I, I read in a table and then I output the head of the table. So in this way, you can see essentially the code and exactly what it, what the type of table it's creating. It's really helpful to have, to, to understand what code does to see the outputs at the various stages. Um, so for data science, these notebooks are really helpful and you can have figures mixed in. Um, as if you write a clear notebook, it's a good way of um, documenting things, having things be visual. So I would look into these. One thing to be careful of is Say you run this cell, then that cell, and then you change the cells and you, you haven't done a run where it starts fresh. The notebook can do things that are you know, out of the order of the sequence that you see of the notebook cells. So whenever you're ready to take a, a notebook and I would say like put it in production, like you think you're done with it, just rerun it from scratch so you know everything ran in order and there's not some uh, dependency that you don't realize. Uh, so, so Jupyter is um, one of the biggest tools for making notebooks. It originally was developed for Python, but they also now have kernels for R and various languages. Um, I think a lot of R people also like R Markdown. Um, any shout out on similar tools or notebook technologies that people use? Do people use R Markdown and Jupyter? Yeah. Okay, so now on to software. Um, I would consider uh, or, or preferentially try to use open source operating systems, languages, and infrastructure because that means you never have to ask permission or can be deprived the ability of using that software in the future. So it's essentially important for reproducibility. Um, now, sometimes that's not always possible. Like, sometimes you may have some big pipeline for your lab, which is written in MATLAB, a proprietary um, software. But when it comes to where you do have a choice, um, try to use open software. And it probably also will give you better job prospects because these tend to be the languages and tools that get adopted the most because there are many incentives, there are no barriers to adopting it. 
Uh, it's important to put a license on your software uh, so people can say make modifications to it, fix the bugs. Um, it also, this is very important because Penn probably will say they own your your code that you create here. I'm not sure how it works at Penn, but that probably is the case if you sign something. Well, if you didn't sign something, you own it. If you did sign something, <laughs> they potentially own it. Um, if it doesn't have an open source license, you could graduate and want to take your code somewhere else, and and Penn could prevent that. Uh, and it could, if you do something commercial that becomes successful, it could be very costly to your company or new university if you don't have an open license. But if you do have an open license, um, it means that anyone can reuse that software, but that includes you. Um, and for most sort of academic software, kind of that's the goal, to have other people reuse it. Um, so this site, Choose a License, can help you uh, pick one. There's a few main ones for open source licenses. Um, I guess this is where it gets really complicated. Technically, if they're the ones who own it, they're the ones who should give approval um, for the open, you know, for you being able to put an open source license on it. But if you kind of have that have that license there from the start. If this decision is like done with the approval of your PI, who kind of a lot of authority is somewhat delegated to. Okay, so in our grants, like like it's a great question. In our grants, we write that the software will be made open source. The grant actually goes to Penn. Like whenever your PI gets a grant, it's not to them personally, it's to Penn. So Penn has legally agreed or agreed in a legally binding way that they're going to openly release the software such that you don't necessarily have to consult them. And we even say it'll be an open source license at the discretion of the PI or researchers such that we don't have to consult them. Um, if you have questions, you should talk to your PI. I'm happy to, to provide advice, not legal advice, but um, <laughs> if you ask the technology transfer office, they almost certainly will say, yes, you can put on an open license. And that may be prudent if you think there could be an issue, but great question. Okay, now now the uh, fun part. Um, are we on you? Is that it? I think so. You're gonna get the pleasure of telling us what Git is. Uh, well, I've mostly interacted with Git through GitHub, um, which I think Git is something distinct and separate from that. But I know it as software or a language that you use mostly as it says there for trying tracking versioning issues and allowing multiple people to access something. So how do you get someone to pull down a copy of some code that you've written and be able to modify it locally, but not modify the main file? or if they want to update the main file, push those uh, changes. Uh, so Git has definitely become much more mainstream, as, at least as far as I've seen, since coding has become much more collaborative. So most labs will have a Git repository for the lab. Um, it's also useful, as it kind of says up there, because since you track the versioning issues, uh, if you're having issues with reproducibility in your own lab, or like the psychophysics experiment no longer works, did something change, uh, you can go check that and see if something has been altered. Excellent description. So. Yeah, I, I think of Git most simply as just a way to track the contents of a directory over time. Um, but it does it in such a way where it's not, say, automatic. Like if you change a file, it's not automatically going to um, take a new snapshot of it. You have to tell it when to update the file. Um, so it kind of requires you to think about where you want the versions to be. Uh, but once you do that, and you have this Git repository, it's called, you can go back to any version that you've taken a snapshot at. And that is extremely helpful. Um, not only does it have, say, the version history, it has commits, which are like the, the messages you make whenever you make a change. So if we go to this project, um, this is a list of commits. And what you'll notice is each commit has a title and, and a description. And so you know like when you did things, but also through this description, if you've done it well, it's that you have to you know, do a good job doing it, you know why you did things. And that tends to be an extremely valuable thing if you want to look back and say, well, why did I change this? Now I don't remember. You know I changed it for this reason. 
Um, and so every commit will say it tracks the changes. Uh, and now the way that the git thinks about changes is through something called a diff. And this is showing a diff. It, it essentially finds the lines in, in a text file that have changed. Um, and so one thing when you're tracking files in git, it helps to think about where the line break should go, like where the new line should go. Um, so for example, you see this says seven here, and while not every piece of text in the line changed, um, the diff is on the level of the entire line. Uh, so one thing when writing markdown documents is I tend to do one sentence per line, like a, a new line after each period, and that helps with tracking it in Git. Uh, so, so another thing people often put in Git repositories is something called a README. And this README actually shows up here. Um, but it's a little bit to tell you, you know, what is in this directory? Uh, what type of analysis or, or program is it? Um, two things I found helpful for file naming. Sometimes you have files that like have a sequence to them. So for example, these notebooks here kind of need to be run in this order. Um, so what I do is I put the first aspect of the, the title is the number, and that makes it so they always get sorted in the right way. And what I then also sometimes do is in the data files that outputs, I put the number of the, the notebook or uh, code that generated it. Uh, so this is more if you have a repository with a lot of data in it. Um, it's different, say, if you have like a software package. Um, another thing that's useful to keep in mind when naming files is to use a date prefix. Not the way that dates are usually presented in English, but um, in ISO 8601 format, where you start with the year, then you have hyphen, a two-digit month and hyphen a two-digit day. Uh, and the beauty here is that these files will then be sorted um, according to their dates. Uh, and that's really valuable. Let me show you. Say here, this is not, this is just like reimbursement <laughs> receipt related, but um, the file name starts with the date and that helps them sort. So if you're like generating wet lab experiments and you need to put them in a repository, uh, it oftentimes is helpful to put the date at the beginning. Um, let's, uh, let's go around the room and say what your favorite text editor is. <laughs> Starting down there quickly. <laughs> nice, okay. So uh, some some good diversity. <laughs> You'll never get everyone to agree on which text editor they like, but um, I'm glad no one like named the built-in Mac text editor, which isn't actually a text editor because <laughs> it can only save in rich text. Um, so a lot of code files a lot of data files are plain text, um, which means it essentially has an encoding so the contents represent different um, alphanumeric characters. And because of that, because so much of what we do in computational science consists of these text files, it's important to have a good text editor. Um, I think people named a lot of great choices. I'm surprised no one named VS Code, which, um, Usually I don't recommend Microsoft products, but this is actually an open source product and it's gaining a lot of popularity. So this is like Python code in it and it's pretty simple. Um, Atom is another great option as are the terminal based ones that, that people named. Um, but it, it seems like people have a good handle on it. Uh, but sometimes you need a text editor if you're dealing with text files. So. 
Let's see, where are we at the circle? Maybe it's your turn to try to explain what a branch is in Git. Okay. <laughs> um, so we talked about how Git is a way that you can track the version of a folder over time. But imagine if you wanted to track, say, multiple parallel histories or versions. Like, oh, I want to try doing this and I want to try doing that and they're mutually exclusive. I, and I'm only going to want one in the end, so I want to kind of try them in different places. Um, that is what a git branch is. You may not need it at the beginning, but probably at some point you will need it. OK, so now that we've talked about git, let's talk about GitHub. GitHub is a web interface and sort of place to host git repositories on the web. So this is a repository here. I have a copy of the repository on my computer. GitHub has a copy of the repository. Usually they're at the same place, although they don't have to be, but I can take commits that are on the GitHub repository that are not on mine, and I can push commits to GitHub that are not on mine. Um, it doesn't happen automatically, but essentially you can say, give me like you know the latest stuff you have here. Uh, what is not on my local computer are these issues, which are just like discussions, um, and pull requests, which here there are none, but this is a pull request. It just a pull request is when you um, propose to change something in a manuscript. Or sorry, <laughs> propose to change something in a repository. That's a way people can collaborate on software online. So uh, what a fork is, is it's a terminology related to GitHub, whereas if you wanted to have a copy of this repository, you can do something called fork which makes a copy on your GitHub account, such that, say, if this Green Lab organization were to delete this, you would still have a copy. Um, and oftentimes, forks are useful because you may not have permission to, say, edit this, but you can make your own fork, make an edit, and then make a pull request to propose to edit here. And that's kind of the main workflow for collaboration. Um, I was going to do an activity where we all make a pull request, but I don't think we'll have time for that. Um, if you want to, you can make a pull request here. If you just want a place to practice that is completely meaningless and you won't break anything if you <laughs> mess up, um, you can do it here. One recommendation I have for your graduate career is try to contribute to an open source project that's not yours. Uh, so you'll probably use a lot of open source software and you'll find a bug. Start by making an issue, you know, like complain that it doesn't work. People appreciate that because it's user feedback, usually, <laughs> hopefully. Um, and then as you get a little bit more experience and see the process of how they tend to address your feedback, go ahead and try to, say, fix a typo that you see in another piece of software that you use. Because fixing a typo is very easy. Um, and then try, you know, to make, um, a bigger change. And if you can do that by the end of your graduate career, that also looks very great to employers. Any questions? See you later. <laughs> um, regarding environments, this is super critical. And it's kind of the idea that if you write some code, it may run on your computer today. Maybe it only runs on one of your computers, like your laptop and not your office computer. And does it run on your computer in a month, in a year? Maybe. In three years, almost certainly it will not, unless you have a specific environment, which says exactly what programs and dependencies it needs. Um, so there are various ways to get environments. The kind of least rigorous way would just be saying, these are like the packages you need to have installed for this to run, um, and this is the version. Uh, there are now kind of better ways where you can use like files which you list all of the um, versions of things you need. One of those is called Conda, which is popular. 
another thing is called Docker, which allows you to sort of take an entire Linux operating system and put it into an image. Uh, and that's sort of the most robust. It's very likely that you'll be able to run it in, say, 20 years. Um, but it, it's a little bit more difficult to use. Um, so just really pay attention to somehow recording the versions of software that you use and try to use a service that makes it easy for you to kind of reinstall those versions elsewhere. Any questions on this? Um, do you, yeah, most of your work? Yeah, like yeah, usually every project I have um, gets its own environment. So it's not like I just have one environment for my computer. Um, so for example, This project, this repository has this con environment, which is saying which packages and versions it needs. Uh, and I'll, I tend to make that for every project. Now, if I'm just kind of playing around, I may not make it immediately. But by time I consider a project to be in sort of a semi-complete state, I definitely want to have this. Um, and especially if I'm going to forget about a project and come back in the future, <laughs> I need to have this before leaving. And I've kind of learned this a hard way, like having stuff break from a few years ago and having no idea why it's breaking. And it takes hours to debug. It, it can take days, weeks to debug sort of environment-related issues because you have no idea why this stuff is breaking. The error messages suck. Um, so save your future self some time, as Ben says, and define it now. Uh, there's also like uh, virtual environments for Python. Um, which tend to be pretty speedy, which is nice. Uh, so another aspect is testing. Uh, so sometimes, say you're writing packages or functions, and you want to make sure they do the right thing. Um, you can write things called tests. And let me just pull up an example of a test. Uh, essentially, this is a test where it runs something and then it makes assertions. This is using the Python PyTest library. Um, but the idea is that once you make these tests, you can start uh, testing that your code behaves in the way you expect it to behave. And um, the nice thing is oftentimes, you know, when you create something, it behaves properly. But then as you start to change other things in your code, at some point in the future, it breaks. Um, if you have these tests, you can always rerun them in the future to make sure that it's currently working. A nice way to do that is called continuous integration, which is something that uh, we use a lot, where every time you make like a, a commit that you give to GitHub, it is running your test suite. So for example, here on this commit, it has run these tests. This is for Linux, and this is for Windows. And um, we can see that everything operated as it should have. And because it, it, it's sort of automated, it helps you, without spending any extra time, know whether you've broken something. So we're reaching the end, but I think we can quickly get through the stuff. Um, you have made your software, you are now publishing your study, and you want to archive your code such that it doesn't go away. Uh, something to think about is potentially putting it on Zenodo or Figshare, um, although I've recently started using Software Heritage. Zenodo and Figshare are just places where you can upload files, it gives them a DOI, and you're not sub it's not easy to delete it, although you probably could email them and make them delete it if you said there was a legal reason. <laughs> um, software heritage kind of just crawls through GitHub. Um, 
and sort of backs up repositories. And this is nice because it preserves the entire history of, say, a Git repository. GitLab is a site like GitHub. It's nice in that it's built on open source software and you can make a mirror so it sort of always stays up to date with your GitHub repository. And this would be helpful if, say, GitHub disappeared overnight. Uh, on data sharing, this probably should be a bigger part of this um, module, but this is super critical. We do a lot of things that involve making data and probably the data is one of the most useful outputs that you'll make, maybe just even more useful than your paper, is the knowledge encoded in data. Uh, so try to use obviously open formats that people can read easily. An example is like sometimes people save say a, a table like a CSV or TSV, which is just comma or tab separated value. Sometimes they save that without a header, which kind of drives me crazy because then you don't know what the fields are. <laughs> um, always try to have data formats that are self-documenting. So like putting a header in the file is a way of self-documentation. Um, consider uploading your data to Zenodo or Figshare. If you're using Git, uh, Git LFS is a good way to um, store bigger files. The one problem is that um, GitHub charges a lot for Git LFS unless you have um, an educational organizational account. Uh, so if you have like a lab GitHub, you can request that they give you a quota and they basically give you unlimited space for free. Um, so that's something to think, think about. The final thing is um, if you want to timestamp your research, like if you want to be able to prove in the future that you had a certain piece of data or manuscript at a certain past, past point in time, you can use time stamping. Um, it's almost like notarizing your work. And that can be useful and it's enabled by some new technological developments. It actually, like this open time stamps um, ends up writing your stuff into the Bitcoin blockchain uh, to make, which is very immutable. And that's how you end up proving that you can, you had your stuff in the past. Um, probably you don't need that, but if you're thinking, oh, I really need to prove that I have this then without necessarily sharing it immediately, you could do this. Well, thanks everyone surviving the 2019 SRR module. Any questions? Yeah, it should be um, here. Do you want me to send it out? Uh, sure. I, I don't know how to do that. <laughs> do you know how I would, if I tweet it, would that be good? I was wondering if you plan to. I'm going to put the recording on YouTube, and it's going to have this. And then when I'm done, I'll tweet that, and I'll send it to Ben. And hopefully... Okay, thanks everyone. Thank you.